As I walked out of the movie theater after seeing Denny Villeneuve's Dune for a second time in IMAX, I felt transfigured. I felt the world around me, and I dared believe that life is, and might be, a far grander thing than I ever imagined. So it saddens me to hear that even on the big screen, many people thought Dune was boring. To be sure, if you anticipate a simple story with simple entertainment, you may grow impatient. But go with tender nerves to enter a world, and you will find a film that can be lived in, as quick, slow, small, and massive as life itself. My personal philosophy is that, in the end, whether something is good or not, it's in my best interest to get the most out of what is there. Sometimes that's not much. Sometimes we might be surprised. So I wanted to make a more in-depth video which not only analyzes the plot of Dune, but also guides people into watching Dune the way I watched it, even if you still find Dune hard to connect with, maybe you can still have a more rewarding experience. If you just want an analysis of the film, feel free to skip to the time on screen, because I first want to say a word on storytelling, world building, symbolism, and boring stories in general. I think a lot of people found themselves bored during the film because of its slow pace. Because there seemed to be several scenes, especially in the beginning, that just seemed pointless or dispensable. But if this is the case, we might find ourselves bored because we aren't reading these scenes correctly. Just as the world is God's spoken language incarnated, dull, dreadful, or ravishing to the extent we understand the language, a film world may be as boring to us as a language we do not understand, mere scribbles upon a page, which if only we knew their meaning, would in the flash of a moment come alive, and become more than scribbles. And our duty as readers and moviegoers is to open our eyes as wide as possible, so as not to see something as boring because we only see the half of it. The manifesto of the good creator and the good consumer is summed up in the words of G.K. Chesterton's essay, What I Found in My Pocket, in which he confesses the dogma, now I deny most energetically, that anything is, or can be, uninteresting. And he proceeds to practice this belief during a boring train ride by pulling items out of his pocket and finding them to be symbols of the world writ small, reading in each mundane item the story of the world. I mention this because it is relevant to Villeneuve's Dune. In order to understand the visual and auditory experiences he creates for us, I think we need to read these visual scenes thematically. Language, after all, consists of signs and symbols, and in order to truly hear the world, both real and cinematic, as language rather than incoherent, unremarkable sounds, we must learn its symbols. Translating them through the eyes and ears into emotion and experiences beyond emotion. A process which can be as difficult as translating a new language, importing new raw meanings of foreign words into our minds, the connotations that are uniquely carried by the word, accumulating with its every usage and colored by its very sound. As with learning any language, it's a difficult skill, but there is hope. Because Villeneuve is a good filmmaker, he's given us a translation key, like a Rosetta Stone, which from the very beginning tells us how to watch his movie. After the opening narration, we first meet Paul and his mother on Caladam. Jessica tells Paul to use something called the voice at breakfast. In this moment, Villeneuve inserts shots around the room, including a painting of Paul's grandfather dressed as a bullfighter and a statue of a man fighting a bull. While these items do have special significance in the books, they are also universally recognized symbols of combat, trickery, and sport. We don't need to read the books to understand that this skill Paul is trying to use is going to be the bullfighter's cape that manipulates the actions of his opponents. From the perspective of editing, we do get a sense that the process of using the voice is about focusing and becoming aware of your surroundings and the room around you. But in another sense, Villeneuve is telling us that he's going to cut to things that might not seem to have anything to do with the main plot, that don't seem to be related directly to what the characters are doing right now, but really 
they do. And we have to watch these scenes wondering and asking how these things are connected. The next sequence of the film transitions to Paul learning about the planet he is about to go to, Arrakis, as an imperial delegation arrives to ceremonially hand Arrakis over to House Atreides. On the surface, it seems like a pretty unnecessary scene, and even Paul himself raises the question at breakfast, why do we need to have a ceremony at all when it's already been decided that Arrakis is going to be given to House Atreides? But Villeneuve evidently wanted this opportunity to tell a story in eyes, as various characters exchange significant glances, the meanings of which we are left only to guess at. In many ways, it's almost like a western scene, something right out of Leone, using eyes instead of words to build conflict. But instead of being a climactic moment, it is inceptive. It starts the conflict. It's the strike of the match. When it comes to world building, I think this is a fine scene. In lieu of more exposition, it gives us scale, costume. It tells us who the Atreides are without exposition. Proud, militaristic, disciplined, honor bound, and dare I say, nationalistic. And it does a fine job of creating one of those situations where you are face to face with someone you know is your enemy, but you have to pretend that you are friends. Dune is an experience-based film as I discussed in my last video. I tried to make the point that Dune is an experiential rabbit's hole to Wonderland. It's a film which must be watched with the whole body. It traces its story down the hairs of your neck and trickles sand into the palm of your hand. Like water that vibrates to the frequency of the sound waves that strike it, Dune wants to reproduce its frequencies in us. The look of defiance, the posture of honorable acceptance, it tries to push filmmaking into a virtual reality experience. If there's a weakness here, it might be that Dune is a world that most people do not want to enter. There will be people who want to have that experience of walking off the ship and reviewing the troops, even of pressing a signet ring into molten gold. And there will be many others who don't. The rest of the scenes on Caladan continue to build the world and introduce characters while also establishing the fact that we are going into a dangerous situation. The introduction of Duncan Idaho serves as an opportunity for Paul to say that he had a vision of Duncan dying on Arrakis, so we know that danger awaits. But Paul wants to go into it. He wants to join Duncan. And this is the Atreides in him, the part that wants to fight the bull for sport. And this penchant for risk is driven home for us in the next scene, as we cut to the Atreides Cemetery, we see a sarcophagus, and on it, a relief of a man fighting a bull. And we are told that Paul's grandfather died fighting a bull. Yes, Paul and his father talk about going into a dangerous situation while standing in their family cemetery. This kind of storytelling might be too on the nose for some, and might go completely unnoticed by others, but for me, it's a great way to squeeze as much meaning and subtext as possible into your scenes. Not only is there a sense of morose reluctance, saying goodbye to home, to your father's grave, leaving the physical space of your family's heritage, but there's also a sense of doom. The training sequence with Gurney Halleck, which follows, tells us that this bullfight can happen at any time, even when we don't expect it or feel like it. Telling Paul never to stand with his back to the door foreshadows the way that Duke Leto will be paralyzed with a dart in the back. Indeed, though Leto cautions Paul time and again against taking risks, it seems the Duke himself won't swallow his own medicine, as time and again, he puts himself in risky situations. We don't blame him for accepting the call to Arrakis, since there is no call that he does not answer, and frankly, we love him for the fact of taking the risk to fly into the desert and of taking the greater risk of rescuing the spice harvesting crew from the sandworm. But in all these cases, he is doing what he told Paul not to do, putting himself in the arena with the bull, just as old Grandpa Atreides did. The Atreides are bound by their blood to fight bulls. And of course, we know who the bull is in this story. Now my understanding is that the name Harkonnen has an etymological connection with the Finnish words for bull and iron. The Harkonnens are the iron bulls. 
And though there is no way we could know that etymological connection merely from the film, we don't need it spelled out for us, because we know intuitively that the Harkonnens are ravaging bulls simply from the symbols we are given. Again, the theme of bullfighting emerges in the Gom Jabbar scene, where, passing by a taxidermied bull's head, Jessica signs to Paul, telling him to remember his training. Here again, there is a connection between the fighting of bulls and Paul's Bene Gesserit skills. Upon entering the room, an ethereal voice asks, Who are you? And the Reverend Mother says, Defiance in the eyes, like his father. Thus folding the ceremony scene into this one. What follows is something Villeneuve referred to as a duel between Paul and the Reverend Mother. The hand in the box is replaced by shots of hands, interpolated between other visions. While the Reverend Mother seems to be controlling Paul by torturing his hand in the box and holding a poisoned needle to his neck, the hand actually manifests itself as belonging to a being who transcends space and time, although Paul himself doesn't really understand this yet. We are confronted with images of hands and fire, for that is what the box contains. A burning sensation of heat upon heat upon heat, but in forms of future visions, transforming the pain and the suffering into potential prophecy, images that will be important later. The burning palm trees in particular have significance in relation to the head of the bull, as they are burning from the Harkonnen attack on Erekin. By the time we leave Caladan, and the bull's head is packed up along with the portrait to be brought to Arrakis, we should be trained to carry these symbols with us too. The Atreides are people who fight and die facing bulls. Indeed, this seems to be their unavoidable destiny. We are shown the bull again before the Harkonnen attack on the palace, right after Leto says, I thought we'd have more time. After that, the next time we see the bull's head is just before and after the Duke dies, which, as far as I can tell, is the last time we see it in this film. And that gives us kind of a sense of finality. In the book, the chapter immediately following Leto's death begins with an epigraph that seems to imply some kind of finality to the fall of the Duke's house. Even though Paul is still alive, it's at this point that Paul begins to transition, if not away from being an Atreides, at least to something more than an Atreides. It's at this point in the book, though not in the movie, that after yet another spice-fueled vision, Paul realizes not just his psychic Bene Gesserit powers, but through them, that he is also, through his mother's line, a Harkonnen. He is the bull. And as we know, both the bull and the Atreides must die. Now Harkonnen shall kill Harkonnen, Paul whispered. The line that opens Book 2 of Dune called Muad'Dib reminds us that, though mutual ensured destruction seems to be Paul's dual birthright, there is a third path, represented by a third animal, a third symbol. An identity that Paul is about to earn, not by blood right, but by becoming that symbol. Going back to the film, after Paul and Jessica refresh themselves with sweat and tears recycled into drinkable water by their tent, they emerge from the sand to find a creature doing the same thing, living off the moisture it creates. The rodent is called Muad'Dib, which, according to the glossary at the end of Dune, is the adapted kangaroo mouse of Arrakis, a creature associated in the Fremen Earth Spirit mythology with a design visible on the planet's second moon. This creature is admired by the Fremen for its ability to survive in the open desert. It's while Paul and Jessica were sheltering in the still tent that in the book, Jessica consulted a book called Manual of the Friendly Desert and comes upon an illustration of a constellation in the Arakeen sky called Muad'Dib, the mouse, a constellation whose tail points north. And through his spice-fueled visions, Paul realizes they'll call me Muad'Dib, the one who points the way. Yes, that's what they'll call me. Instead of giving us all this exposition in the film, Villeneuve streamlines this prose exposition with simple shots of the kangaroo mouse itself. Their comparison and their similarity tell us that Paul is beginning to become 
Muad'Dib. He is, as Kynes says in the film, a lost boy hiding in a hole in the ground. But like the kangaroo mouse, he is able to survive. In fact, this process of transformation began much earlier, as we remember that back in the royal palace before the Harkonnen attack, a connection had been made between the little rodent and Paul himself. As he learns about the little mouse, Paul imitates it by hiding in the light to escape the hunter-seeker, mimicking the rodent who hides in the brush. And now that connection is brought full circle as Paul and Jessica use the Fremen sandwalk, which had also been associated by proximity with the mouse, to traverse the desert. Visions of the mouse accompany the desert crossing, along with the Benny Jesser voices telling us that even a little mouse can survive. Paul reaches a, a kind of milestone of transition when he fights Jamis. While bull and mouse imagery are noticeably absent in this sequence, we do have Chani, who was recently associated with the mouse, leading Paul to it in his vision. I also did find a screenplay which, though I have no way of knowing if it's authentic or not, does compare Paul's movements in the fight specifically to that of a matador, a bullfighter. Do with that what you will. What we do know is that in the act of killing Jamis, in a sense, Paul Atreides also dies, so that the Kwisatz Haderach may rise. This is explicitly what the Bene Gesserit voices tell Paul during the duel. Paul Atreides must die for Kwisatz Haderach to rise. Don't be frightened, don't resist. When you take a life, you take your own. So, Paul Atreides must die, but not the physical death of death in combat, rather the spiritual death, the psychological death, the loss of self, whatever you want to call it, that happens when one kills another. If we look at the book, this is hinted at in the funeral ceremony for Jamis, where the narrator tells us, Paul felt the diminishment of his self as he advanced into the center of the circle. It was as though he lost a fragment of himself and sought it there. Thus, in this duel, the connection between Paul's two birthrights, which the Reverend Mother invoked during the Gom Jabbar scene, the maternally inculcated Bene Gesserit skills, and his paternal identity as an Atreides, are now brought together in perfect harmony. Paul is completely Atreides, the killer who dies, completely Bene Gesserit, as the Kwisatz Haderach. He now begins to step into the messianic role that was carved out by the Bene Gesserit on Arrakis and foreshadowed all the way back at the beginning of the film with the breakfast scene. Only through the Atreides bullfight can the Kwisatz Haderach arise. It's worth pointing out that the one prominent symbol that we do get here is that of the ducal signet ring with its Atreides hawk. It represents being sealed or bound to Arrakis, but also of finding one's own way to power and leadership. Paul never wanted the ring or the position of duke, wanting rather to go to Arrakis to find the Fremen with Duncan Idaho, perhaps spurred on by his dreams to do so. But now he is beginning to see that both of these things are connected. The ring which he now wears represents a faithfulness to his father's vision, as well as a continued faithfulness to a deal made to a traitorous emperor. The emperor sent us here, and here we will remain. A faithfulness which, though it was in a sense their downfall, will also prove to be the strength and victory of the Atreides. Though I will say, in aforementioned screenplay, it says that Paul takes off the ring just before the duel, and I cannot for the life of me remember if that happens in the film. Let me know in the comments if any of you can remember that, because obviously that would have quite a bit of its own significance. In the aftermath of the duel, Paul rejects the idea of leaving Arrakis to go back to Caladan, choosing instead to learn the way of the desert. In the book, after Paul kills Jamis, he is allowed to choose a new Fremen name and he chooses to be called after the kangaroo mouse, Muad'Dib. Thus, with the conclusion of this first part, the story of Paul Atreides, if it doesn't come to an end, it's put on pause, so that the story of Paul Muad'Dib can be carried on in the next film. The victory through death which was merely partially typified in the death of Duke Leto will prove to be a shadow that was cast backward through time by the embodied fulfillment of Paul. In Dune, 
Villeneuve is taking us into a world of similitudes. A world where everything that exists really is like everything else, in some way. Men really can be like bulls, or the desert, or little kangaroo mice. And Villeneuve takes us into this world because this is the kind of world Herbert created. Frank Herbert refers to the Atreides portrait and the bull's head as talismans, a word denoting an object that either has some mystical or magic power, or even a person which is representative of a group. It's a word which may have roots going back to the Greek telos, which indicates the end, goal, or completion. In the film, we can understand that these objects are talismans because they are always draped around our necks. They follow us from beginning to end. With his cinematography and his editing, Villeneuve is teaching us our letters and pronunciations in the language of the Kwisatz Haderach, training our eyes for the man who is diminutive to nothing. No easy task by any means. In Dune, we can only understand characters by understanding the world around them. The objects, the immensity, the mutual indwelling of it all, Herbert and Villeneuve create this kind of world because, in some sense, this is the way the real world is. We are like the things in our pockets, the rings on our fingers. We cannot understand ourselves apart from them, and we harm no one but ourselves by breaking faith with them. They are the translation key that open the language of life.